Hi everybody. Um, just before we start, I, uh, I, I usually take a few seconds to, to do a quick poll. Um, so who is more of a, a CIO or VP level uh, in an organization? Okay, who is typically a manager, so with responsibility for, for teams, one team or many teams? Okay, who uh, is a developer? Okay. Who is an IT person? IT ops? Okay. DevOps, maybe? Okay. <laughs> who is using the public cloud, like Amazon Web Services, for example, or others? Okay. Who is thinking about using the cloud? Okay. Who never raised their hand? <laughs> You're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I, I tend to, to start this presentation with, uh, with that book, maybe you, you've read it, uh, Fall of, of, uh, uh, of Giants from Ken Follett. Uh, it tells a story about what happened before World War I uh, in, in Russia, in France, in the US, in Germany, in the UK. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a great book. First, it's uh, for people who who, who, who like to, 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 to hear what happened and how it happened. I like this because it had drastic changes at the country level in how those big powers, uh, um, those giants uh, changed. Uh, but uh, also it's interesting to see how all of uh, those changes really came from, from the bottom up with lots of social changes who, who brought further changes. And, and so I think it, 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 it's, a, it's a great lead into what's going on now in this industry uh, with, uh, with lots of the uh, changes going on uh, as, as we'll see, you know, with the cloud, with continuous delivery and so on. I think we're going to see the same type of, of impact with a lot of the giants, uh, the big companies that we've been used to uh, be challenged uh, by lots of, of, of new forces. Anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's uh, de go, go deeper. So, end of the 19th century, you, you had those uh, strange machines, you couldn't see many of those. Those were the first electrical generators. So that was high tech by then, right? Uh, back then it was really like uh, owning uh, one of those big machines, big server, really uh, uh, top notch. Very complicated, very complex, very expensive. Only the biggest companies could afford that. Some communities could afford that, but it was really high hand. And, and it pretty much took us about 50 years uh, uh, and it's still going on for, for part of it, to go from an high-end product that's very hard to master to a commodity, right? Where you don't care where this is being produced. This is being produced by uh, a specialist because they know how to operate a, a nuclear plant, maybe. Uh, then you get a grid to distribute that all over the place. And then you have a plug. And you as a user, you just care about this, right? And your only expectation is that it's always up. If there is no electricity, any electricity anymore, that's when you see it, right? It's a kind of a transparent thing, commodity. You only realize that you have it when you don't have it anymore, and, and, and it's a problem. So, but it took us 50 years to, to, to get this completely standardized. And I think if you look at IT today, we're pretty much in, in, uh, in, in that situation. So that's a typical uh, IT stack, you know, from this data center, networking, firewall, servers, uh, uh, operating system, middleware, load balancers, and at the end of the day, obviously, your beloved application. And this is a bit like building your own electricity generator, right? right? Uh, uh, you really build everything. You have to own everything and be an expert in all of those layers. That's a massive investment. Just take the server market, it's 40 billion, just that Lego block in the middle, 40 billion a year being sold. And so uh, it's, it's really, it's really imp impressive, I think, when, when you look at all of that, to think that just to do this, to create applications, you need to own and be good at everything that's below. And it's, it provides little differentiation, right? Meaning, uh, is this really uh, your business to be the best at installing Linux? Well, not quite. Your business is maybe as a bank to have the best services, to offer the best interest rate, uh, to make more money. Uh, yet, y you became an expert in all of those fields. And what's worse is that critical mass matters. So if you're a big company, you can maybe hire expert in every field. And because you have so much mass, you can 
uh, reduce those costs over that many, uh, that many servers, that big of a deployment. If you're a small company, well, it's hard because you need to try to be an expert in all of those layers with actually very small workloads. And so that's, that's the iceberg situation, right? You only want to get the tip of the iceberg, but you're forced into building everything before to get uh, to that uh, little uh, tip uh, out there. So what we've seen in, 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 in the industry, in nature, everywhere, we tend to go towards simplification, standardization. Uh, uh, everybody wants to be focused because that's where they're best. And so we've seen it here, right, with, with the nuclear plants. You don't, re you don't operate a nuclear plant, I suspect. <laughs> you don't even buy a pre-built nuclear plant with a user guide telling you how to install that in the backyard of your company, right? Th that's, that would be foolish. That would be completely crazy. You just want to say, I need that many amperes, that, many, that much voltage, give it to me and don't screw it up. That's it. Then you consume it and you build your IT on top of that. Um, and, and that works. You only care about that part here. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think about IT, we're kind of in the same situation, right? And so, um, <coughs> what you should really be doing is, is focusing on where you can differentiate. You're going to be differentiated because you, your applications are going to be the best. That's really the tip of the iceberg. You want to, to create value at this level. This here is not going to differentiate you. So, a lot of the discussions around how to do things are completely useless because you're not going to differentiate because you're better at installing Linux. That's what we, what we hear a lot, right? All about these optimizations on how to do things better and how I can install Linux faster than you can because we have better tools. That has no value to customers. And so sometimes we, we, we tend to forget as engineers that IT has two main purposes. First one is to make more money to the company, bring more money to the company. And the second one is to spend less money. Cost reduction, right? If you're more efficient, you, s you're, you, you don't need to spend that much money to do the same thing. And if you can create innovative products that will appeal to the market, you'll get more customers, you'll make more money. So a lot of the time we discuss about very interesting debates about you know, operating system, firewall, networks, and so on. But truth is, if this doesn't bring more money or reduce cost, this is just noise. So if, uh, if we look at what happened in the cloud, for example, um, really, we've, we've tried in the cloud to deconstruct this iceberg and try to look at this stack, this stack and say, well, uh, uh, how can we do the same thing as what happened with, with nuclear plants, essentially, right? And, and try to outsource those elements of the stack that are non-differentiating. And so you hear a lot about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Who never heard about infrastructure as a service or platform as a service? I know it's a tough question. I should always ask the other question because it's, yeah, I never heard about, the, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, hard, it's tough to do, right? Nobody likes to recognize it. They never heard about that, but it's, you know, yes, pass and SAS. And everybody tends to be very focused on I, P, and S. What's infrastructure versus platform versus software as a service? Well, that's not the point. The point is really, you should focus on the last three letters, A, A, S, as a service. And so that's what we really need to understand when we switch to the cloud. We're switching to an economy of IT as a service. You're not responsible anymore for providing those layers. You're not the one that needs to be an expert at all things in security, network security, in middleware, in operating system optimization, and all of that. This is provided to you as a service. Could be middleware, could be networking, whatever, as a service. So you are starting to consume that like an electrical plug. And the only thing you know is when it's down. That's only the only time when you should care about it. Other than that, you should really focus on the green part. The green part is where you're going to get new market share, more money, or spend less money. Anything else? Noise. So this is really you know, the picture I'm trying to, to put in your head. This has to become a commodity. You need to get that as a service and focus on, on, on everything uh, on top. Um, obviously, you're not buying, installing, configuring that service. Obviously, under the hood, it's software, but you don't care if it's software because you're going to consume it as a service. 
behind the hood, if it's running on, on, on a big machine, on small machines, whatever, as long as it respects the SLA and the API uh, you're using, you should be fine. Much like with electricity, right? You don't really care when you're using your laptop whether the electricity came from a nuclear plant or from wind. You might care for ethical reasons, but you don't care as a user of your laptop. It's just the same commodity. <coughs> and so the idea here is to increase or to reduce, to get a better time to market, because you don't need to focus on all of those matters. It's to get a competitive advantage, reduce your capex, reduce your capex and, and opex. We're going to obviously talk more about that because cloud is not just the magical answer to, to, those, uh, to, to those topics. But, but really, if the, ba the basic equation you can have is you're going to be spending 100 in your company on marketing, sales, engineering, GNA, whatever. Let's say you're going to be spending 10 or 15 on IT. All, all things IT. How much of those 15 are gonna be for new projects, new product differentiation, and how much is gonna go to building a nuclear plant? And you decide where you put that cursor, right? Is it maybe two points out of 15? Is it eight? Is it 10? If it's 10, it's five times better than it, if it's two. So it makes a big difference. And it's, it's really, the challenge ahead of us. We're starting to see more and more companies leveraging more and more of those uh, uh, stacks that are provided as a service, and that slowly moves the cursor uh, towards more added value, differentiation, rather than maintaining their own nuclear plant. So th that's a big change that's taking place on, on the market. And what does it mean? So what one part is, is really what does it mean for the market, for the big vendors we're seeing? And the next part I'd like to go through is what does it mean for you, right? It's good to see what happens at almost a philosophical level on the market for those vendors, but then it probably has an impact for you as a company, as an end user as well. So for the giants, what I did here is I, I took the same stack and I've put some of the names uh, that provide solutions for those, for those items. You'll probably recognize a quite a few of those vendors. There are many more, obviously. We, we saw that just, you know, the HP, Dell, uh, IBM, and so on, that's 40 billion per year. So uh, you have quite a few uh, vendors that can be part uh, in, in that market. And just look at, at what happens. Like, that's a PC market. That's a growth in 2013. We see a, a, a reduction in, in, in how those companies can sell those servers or those machines just because the market is moving away from those way of consuming uh, IT. Uh, uh, that's Oracle and IBM on average, you know, stable, going down for IBM. It's, it doesn't mean that those companies are not doing the right thing. It's, it's just hard, right? Because the more you consume uh, uh, cloud resources, for example, the less you're going to buy net new servers uh, um, in a traditional fashion. You're not going to consume servers on, you know, buy new servers on both sides. You have to choose where you want to go. Um, and this one is interesting as well. So the PC shipment growth rate, we see that it went, it, it's clearly going down. And this line here is when the iPad was launched. So I'm not trying to say here that the iPad is a magical solution and you just need an iPad and, and you, you'll be fine. You don't need a, a desktop to do your job. No, you still need. But we can see that it's not just on the server side that the impact happens. If you remember the picture we had between nuclear plants, distribution, and uh, uh, the plug, the, the standard plug, we're kind of seeing the same thing take place in IT with uh, standardization slowly taking place. It's going to take decades, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. But uh, on the server, with the as a service model, yes, pass, SaaS, whatever we want to uh, slice it, who cares? Then we have this distribution network in the case of IT, it's very, it's very uh, uh, advanced. It's called the internet, right? We have our own distribution network already. And then the client, HTML5, is becoming the new plug. And it's impacting everybody. I suspect that if you had to implement new applications today, you would probably think about mobile application, nati native mobile application, or HTML applications. If you remember just a few years ago when there was this drama between Adobe and Apple on Flash, everybody was so excited about, yeah, but are you pro or against Flash? 
do we even <laughs> discuss that topic anymore? No, it's, it's, it's over, right? Who would start today a project based on Flash for, for their customer, right? And so, 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 so HTML5 is becoming this new plug. So we're seeing this standardization slowly taking place uh, on the market uh, and, and really disrupting uh, a lot of those, those vendors. And so those vendors are really under attack from all over the place. And what's interesting when you have disruption is that typically if you're a big vendor, you don't need to be the best. You can be number two, number three, but you're like a spider, you have many feet. And once one of your feet is under attack, say the database business or the operating system, well, it hurts, but you have seven other feet to play on. And so it gives you time to you know, react, maybe buy a company, improve, and then five years after, you're again number three, number two, and you're good to go. But what's interesting here is that we're seeing a, a big change for five, 10 years where you have cloud, big data, the change on the client side, mobile or, or truly client, uh, uh, social, search. And we see lots of the giants that were playing on many of those fields being attacked on all of their feet. And that's unique because they have to keep revenue stream active and many revenue, healthy revenue stream active at the same time. But once you're under attack on many of those, it becomes very hard to, to cross the chasm and go beyond that. Uh, and that's somehow what startups and smaller companies face, right? You see that in many markets, the number one is not a, a, a huge company. It can be a single a company with one or two products. Uh, and when they're under attack, it's very hard for them to, to recover because that was their only market. So what's unique is that the giants are under attack at this point of all of those changing, converging uh, at the same time. So let's see if we're going to see those giants under attack. It's probably because some other giant will emerge, right? I think one of them is AWS, that's Amazon Web Services. So Amazon is known for selling books. Uh, for selling many things. And many people, if you ask people not in IT, you would ask, uh, do you know what AW Amazon is, is doing? They would purely say books, that's it. But actually, Amazon is the number one in cloud, in public cloud. And those are the expected or the, the, uh, the because they don't give specific numbers for AWS. So those are what the market thinks the revenue from it, Amazon are on AWS, so the public cloud. And as you can see, it topped at close to 4 billion in, um, in 2013. And what's interesting in that growth, I think, are the first five years of AWS, under a billion, under half a billion. And that, I think, is the reason why a lot of people still speak about AWS in a slightly condescending manner. You know, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's good for kids, it's good for small startup, but frankly, not for us. Yeah, because with half a billion, you know, how much impact do you really make on the market? Uh, it can't be that big. And there is always an inertia when you have a, uh, an image on a, on a company, when you think about something, when you, you cast a company as being for small companies and so on, it tends to, to have inertia and you still think like that. But look after those far, five first year, right? Above one billion, two billion, four billion. And the expectations from analysts, not from uh, me, hopefully, is, is going to be 6 billion this year and close to 9 billion in 2015. Um, and this is very feasible. Uh, AWS just released their, their revenue. It's expected that in Q1 they did, uh, uh, or in Q4, uh, uh, close to 1.2 billion for the quarter. That's a 4.8 billion run rate. So I speak about billions like they were uh, 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 pennies. Uh, it's hard to, to, to put that in perspective sometimes. So just to put that in perspective with two companies you probably know, Red Hat, the leader in, in Linux, one of the default operating system out there. 1.2, about 1.2 billion revenue, right? <coughs> VMware, the leader in virtualization, 4.3 billion. Um, so Obviously, it's, we're kind of comparing up apples and oranges because they're not exactly doing the same thing. But trying to cast AWS as just a company for startups, I think, is doing a, a really a, a disservice uh, to, uh, to, 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 to the IT market. 
So we'll see, but I suspect this is going to be uh, one of the next giants. So one of the comments that I hear a lot is, yeah, but OK, I'm a good company doing software. So what you're saying is that people don't want to mess up with software anymore, right? They don't want to buy license, receive a CD or a DVD, install, ask their IT guy to install, to, to buy machines, to set up a, a, a network, load balancing, blah, 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 to end up with a piece of working software. Now they want to say, hey, Mr. Vendor, I'd like my 50 users to, to use your software. When? Well, tomorrow. Let's go. As a service, you know, I plug, I want to use your CRM. I plug, I want to use your ERP. I don't want a two years project for my first beta phase. I want it now, right? So the question is, well, but we have a great software solution. Can't we just uh, become a service vendor, right? At the, end, at the end of the day, it's a long series of one and zero. We just need to put them in the right order and, and that should work. Well, it's, it's very hard. What we see is that producing software, static software versus producing, delivering a service is very different. Uh, the way you do your engineering, the way you do your marketing, your sales, all of that is different. Think about engineering, for example. When you do engineering for software, for example at Red Hat, whenever the, 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 the executive team says, or the product team says, you know what, we should do a release, say, I don't know, RHEL 6.5, because we need to branch and, and deliver a 6.5 with this virtualization or that virtualization. Well, that, that looks like a, a stupid decision, very basic de decision. Well, actually it's not, because they have contracts with lots of customers that says, well, you have to support us for three years or five years, or in the telco world, 10 years, sometimes more than 10 years. And so these releases they're going to be doing that day, they know that during 10 years, they'll have to backport bugs. They'll have to do testing on new hardware and so on and so on. So they know that on average, they'll have to hire about 10, 15 persons just for that dot X release. Say one, one million and a half per year, one and a half million per year to spend just for that dot X release. If you go in an as a service model, that's not how it works. You don't have Gmail 1.0, Gmail 2.0, Gmail 3.0, or Salesforce 6.5, no. Those SaaS vendors typically keep one version. Sometimes they have a window of, of releases running in parallel, two, three. So you, you, they give you time to migrate from one to the other. But they have a very small scope to support. They don't have a huge history to QA and support over time. So they're going to bring their focus on innovation and new features, giving them yet another lead in how they compete on the market. Sales. If you have to compensate your sales guy to sell software, well, we know how to do that, right? Sell for three years, big check, X person for the sales team, here you go. Take an as a service model. That's not how it works. If you've used Salesforce or Zendesk or Gmail, you start with two, three, five, ten users, and then you grow if it works, you do proof of concept and so on. So you might have your sales guy work for three months on an account, and then the customer says, yeah, it seems great. We're going to try it and take your 200 bucks a month subscription, and we will see, uh, we'll meet again in six months. Well, different business, right? Doesn't mean it's not possible. Salesforce is, is, is very successful, but it's a different model. So that's a challenge for those vendors. So um, now we've seen what it means, all of those shifts taking place at the same time for those big vendors and why we're seeing so much passion around what's going on with HP, why does Microsoft need a new CEO, what should be the profile of that new CEO, oh, he comes from the cloud division, by the way, and so on and so on, right? It's, it's, it's really all over the place right now. But what does it mean for us, for you, as user of that technology, as customers of those big guys? Well, don't follow the giants or don't become a giant yourself. I guess that's, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, the bottom line. Uh, I think the way to win is to focus on market differentiation. Again, if you have 15% of your p and that you're going to be spending uh, on, on IT-related tasks, how much are you going to allocate to differentiation versus keeping the lights up? That's really your choice. Um, and so, uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we look at this stack again, uh, YASPAS and, applica and, and application, uh, 
it's obvious that one way to do that is, is to focus on applications. So, well, my, my uh, advice would be to go and use more of the cloud. It's not the only answer. We're going to talk about CI, continuous delivery as well. But a, a clear part of the answer is to delegate those non-core issues to somebody else and not think that because you're very good at maintaining WebLogic, JBoss, and Linux, that you're going to win on the market. So how to get there? Because it's one thing to say, I ah, just outsource and you're good to go. OK, good. But uh, wait, uh, we have like IT assets that are 10 years old, 20 years old. How do we do with that? Well, one option is to move everything to the cloud in one snap. Um, that's what I call the, the punk approach. Um, and uh, that might work, especially if you're a small company. I suspect that's not uh, what you want to try. <coughs> so one of the solutions that we've seen work very well is what we call core IT and fast IT. So what is core IT and fast IT? It's, it's almost like a, a mini methodology uh, that can help companies get started on creating more innovation. So that's where companies are today, typically, right? You have your own data center. Maybe you are renting some space at a, a, at a colo uh, data center. You have Oracle databases, IBM, WebSphere, SAP for your CRM, ERP, and so on. So, you know, pretty traditional, nothing, nothing fancy here. Um, and then you need to go there. So what that means is that you have your VP of marketing coming to you and saying, hey, uh, we, we do need a mobile application for our services. Oh, yeah? W when do you need that? Well, like tomorrow. Because you know what? In that new world, if we don't have a mobile application, we're not talking to our customers. People just want to see it on their iPad, want to see it on their iPhone. If they have to go and use sophisticated tools, nah, I don't have time. You know, I want to do that while I'm on the bus or the subway or when I'm working. I don't want to do something specific just because I'm using the software of that bank or that insurance. So I need this. I really need this. Plus, the competition has it, so we need it. So it's tough, right? Because you're not going to write your new Android and, and iPhone applications that goes hop, directly into your ERP. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just put some big fat uh, Java driver from SAP in my Android application. We're good to go. You realize it's not going to work. Plus, most of the time, you don't really know what you need. Because you're going to say, you're going to tell your VP of marketing, OK, but what do you need? I don't know. I mean, you know, something kind of cool and sexy, and I should be able to access the main features. Yeah? Uh, can you be a bit less specific here? You don't know. There is some discovery that needs to take place. And that discovery, trying to find what's the right angle, takes time, takes iteration. Can you do iterations and fast processes here? Most of the time, you can't. Your core IT environment is relatively strict. If you want to order a new uh, server, you typically have to uh, uh, fill in a form and wait six months to get an empty, an empty server. That's not where you're going to do a lot of experimentation. Yet, you have to. So what we've seen work is what we call fast IT. And so those companies are not trying to negate core IT. It's here. There is no reason to hide it. There is no reason to even change it. It's working. Don't change that so something that's working. Plus, you have dozens of projects to do here. You know, things are never perfect, I suspect. You have the new version of SAP to install. So the IT team is certainly not lacking any work. But what you can do with fast IT is kind of instantiate um, a mini version of your core IT with a development environment that makes it possible for your development teams to start a new project, code, test, do continuous integration, continuous delivery, push to staging, push to production, maybe push to multiple regions. So you want to push in the US, in Europe at the same time. Guess what? They don't need IT to do that. This, those are the best practices we've known for a long time. And so what those fast IT environments, those platform as a service provide, is kind of a, a, a productized version, an automated version of those best practices. And they know how to do that very well. And so what this means is that your development team, 
doesn't need to be retrained. They don't need to learn new tools. They don't need to learn new languages. They can start implementing their fancy iOS and Android application and some intermediary application here. The two are going to be communicating together. They're going to be evolving very fast. Maybe you're going to do one release every week, every day. And here, this application, this proxy in the middle, is going to access some of your core IT servers. So maybe for this uh, application that shows your product and, and, and your orders, you need to access the CRM and part of the ERP. So we're going to configure a firewall to just enable that. But it doesn't impact at all what you're doing in core IT. And your development team has a full ability to start innovating uh, uh, at, at a faster speed using their existing expertise and uh, accessing those new type of devices. And so it's not core IT versus fast IT, but it's really core IT and fast IT. It's an extension of, of core IT. Um, so let's zoom into this uh, fast IT. Um, so a, a big part of, you know, we're kind of mixing two topics that get along very well together. Uh, so one of them is cloud. And cloud, forget about cloud in itself. It's really the as a service. When you hear cloud, try to hear as a service. Change the way you consume software, right? And it goes very well with another concept, which is a continuous integration and continuous delivery. And the idea here is, well, since I can consume my service very, very easily, I can do much like those successful SaaS, YaaS, PaaS vendors myself. Why? Why would I want, as a customer, to consume Salesforce as a SaaS? Because I think it's very useful. But my customer, for whatever reason, no, they don't want that. They want fat software they need to install, maintain, monitor themselves. No, they want the same things. They want productivity as well, right? And so that's where uh, it becomes important for you to use the same tricks, the same tools as those vendors are using. And so if you look at a lot of what's going on in companies today, you have software cycles that are very long. Can be six months, can be nine, 12, 18 months between releases. And what you need to understand, again, from a purely financial standpoint, is that all of the code you're working on during six, nine, 12 months, that's not being released, it's like inventory. It's like if you were building stock of stuff, keeping it in a stock, and that's it. It's not producing anything, right? You have implemented that amazing feature, well, it's not released. If it's not released, it's dead. You might as well not implement it. Plus, it's even worse. While it gets there, you know, as much as if, if this, those were bananas, they could, get, uh, uh, they could go bad, you know, and, 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 and get too old. Well, the same is true with code. As code stays here, maybe once you release it, it's not exactly what your customers need anymore. How do you know? I don't know. So. The only option is to push that value outside of in your inventory at a faster pace, right? You don't want to see that happen in your, in your engineering team. So fast IT is not just about changing the way you consume those services and not doing everything, become, be, being the expert in Linux and middleware and so on. It's also to behave more like a product company, to have a team that lives with this product, that owns that product, and that's going to do iteration on that product very fast. And you want that iteration to, to happen and very quickly be released into production. <clears throat> and not just that, but you want this release to be put in production and measured. Because if it can be measured, you should maybe ask yourself whether that should even exist in the first place. Right? Does it add value or not? And if it adds value, there must be a way to measure it. So sometimes in some domain, it's a bit extreme. But in many cases, if there is a product requirement to add something, find a way to measure it. Push it to production, measure. Does it match expectation or not? If it does not, kill it. If it does, keep it. Move on to the next one. Small iterations. Think about mobile application. If you're going to wait 18 months to push your first version of your mobile application, you push it and feedback is like, no, that's not what we want. OK, um, let's try with a version two, right? And goodbye. We're going to meet you in 18 months. Not good. You lost 18 months and you're going to lose again 18 months. If you can push after a month, after two months, a minimal viable product of your application, 
measure. Does it appeal people or not? You don't need to have fancy application to, pe to, to have people give you feedback. It's like, yeah, it's kind of good. I like this part, this part, but frankly, you're missing this, 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 and that. Yeah, I know, but you know, we've been working on that for three months. So what do you really need? Oh, this feature is really missing. OK, I'm going to do just this one. Really, that again, do you like it? Yeah, it's pretty good. But what I really meant was this, and so on, and so on. And you adapt. And in 18 months, you have 10, 15, 20 feedback from your users. So those are some of the slides from Gartner that I, uh, that I liked. Um, uh, the SDF, uh, herb there is not from Gartner, as you can imagine. I'm not sure where, where that comes from. Uh, so this one is, is uh, they explain, and, and uh, you, should, uh, you should, if you're interested, read uh, some, some documents from Mac Huttle. Um, I think they have some pretty good stuff. Uh, and you look at you know, how you typically move from an ID to a delivery of ID, and it can, can take a long, long time. Um, and uh, uh, they have this notion that you should start working uh, on the concept of what they call capability. So instead of creating a big project and saying, okay, we are onboarding on this mega gigantic project for 24 months with that much budget. No, you have a product team and you just focus on what is the next capability you want to push. Small thing, work on it, measure and decide and so on, right? But change the way you work. Uh, and you know, they have also this, this, this one that I like pretty well is instead of saying, well, we didn't do anything. And suddenly we had this massive project and then nothing again. Well, you have that discovery process and, and sometimes you regress, sometimes you improve and so on, but it's kind of a continuous way of improving the business and showing results to the business instead of building a huge inventory. And what they, what they also focus on, and again, that's Gartner, but it's, it's pretty uh, uh, obvious in, in many, uh, in many uh, methodologies, is, is, is also it's a matter of organization and uh, organizations on how you, you drive people, right? Sometimes you see in organizations you have a pool of developers and they're being sent and shipped uh, to work two weeks on that project, three weeks on this one, and there is no real feeling of ownership of what is the business doing. And, and so maybe we need to rethink about how we aggregate people with a feeling of ownership for a product in the long run. Right? And it's not about, oh, I need to do my project and move on. It's no, let's make that business unit, that specific thing, successful. And that might mean doing 20 iterations. Um, uh, just uh, thinking about how much time it can take to be successful. Think about Facebook, for example. Uh, Facebook got hit badly because they didn't know how to make money on mobiles. And uh, uh, obviously, they make money on, on, on advertisement. They knew how to do advertisement on a, on a browser, but they didn't know how to, do, to make money on mobile. And if you look at the traffic go originating from mobile devices for Facebook, it was growing like crazy. So it's more than half of the traffic. And so if you can't monetize this, you have a big problem. So Wall Street punished Facebook. And now they're getting their act together. But it took them time, lots of discovery, lots of innovation. And, uh, and now they found a way, and the stock is doing, is doing great. But it took them work. And if you're going to wait each time 18 months to try something, you're not going to survive. So can you move from 6, 9, 12, 18 months to maybe once a week, or once a day, or multiple times a day, and get an empty inventory? So the traditional IT vision of things is, is really, I release a V1. Then I sit down with my team, we talk to users, we think about what we should do for a V2, we work on V2 for 18 months, we release it. If we have multiple uh, distribution or consumers of that, sometimes you can force a change, but sometimes you can just say, hey, it's there, please migrate. And when IT has time, they move to V2. And in the meantime, you keep supporting V1, V2, and so on. That's, that's a life we're used to. If you take a fast IT approach, you release this man minimum viable product. You implement micro features, these capabilities, as uh, Gartner calls them, and then you deploy, you measure, and you keep or you kill, and you move on, and so on. And in, in, in that scenario, obviously, this is your inventory, this micro feature. So um, what, we, what we've built at CloudBase is really based on that philosophy of fast IT, continuous integration, and continuous delivery. Some companies can move to the cloud. 
So that's great. They can use our tools. Some companies can't move to the cloud for legal reasons because whatever. Uh, they just can't. So we have to offer a way for all companies to get to a better way to produce software, to a better way to produce value independently of, of uh, at what stage they are. So um, we, we, we offer a complete uh, 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 environment to do continuous integration, uh, to implement your continuous integration processes based on, on Jenkins. Um, and uh, that's, that's typically for your development team. So how do you end up with stable, working, tested software at the end of the process? And then you obviously need to deploy that software. Uh, so uh, you could do that on the cloud base pass in the public cloud. So you don't want to handle anything. So that's the core IT fast IT picture I've shown before, where you don't need to focus on servers, on firewalls. Everything is provided as a service following the best practices in that field. Or you might want to take that software you've released and deploy it to another pass, which would be public cloud or on-premises. You might want to push that in the cloud on your own infrastructure that you manage also you know, known as DevOps. Maybe you have your own script to do Chef, Puppet, and, and manage your own infrastructure. You don't want a pass vendor to do that for you. Or maybe you want to do that on premises, deploy that to virtualized environment or a web sphere application server, whatever. You have multiple <laughs> ways to do that. But at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. What matters is that your process uh, uh, implements what you need to provide continuous integration and continuous delivery at the business level. <coughs> so this is, you know, kind of uh, the quote, right? Always be in a release-ready stage. Sometimes some people tell me, yeah, but I don't want to push a new version every day. It makes no sense. Uh, that's fine. I understand that. Uh, uh, if you are a, a car producer, right? Maybe you don't want to push a new version of the software in the car, in every car every day or twice a day. Okay, fine. But at least you should be ready to do so, right? Maybe the business is going to come and say, oh, we have a, a big issue, big bug, big security issue. The NSA can drive your car. So we need to push a, a, a patch now. OK, can we do that? Sure, should be the answer. If your answer is, yeah, sure. So we need to apply process P1, P2, P3. What does that mean? It means six months, essentially. OK, well. Uh, so uh, so, so that, that, that's the point. Release ready doesn't mean you are going to do it. It means you can do it. It's your decision. So a few words on core IT and fast IT. This is not about should I use a data center or should I use a public cloud. It's not even should I use public cloud versus private cloud. Right? Frequently, we're again lost in those kind of very technical decisions. Sometimes they're almost political decisions on, yeah, I should be public cloud, I don't trust them, blah, blah. That's not the point. It's about how can you extend and leverage your existing assets. Your IT is here to stay. It's not going to just disappear because then you fell in love with continuous integration and continuous deployment. You have to slowly improve over things, but it's there. So how can you find ways to do that? And um, it's not just going to be different tools. I think that's, that's the important part. Um, it's, it's a bit like SOA a few years back, right? It's the kind of things where if you, if you think that just because you're going to put uh, Jenkins in the pass, everything will uh, magically happen, those are implementation tools. What you need to make sure is that you have bottom-up and top-down agreement within the organization to drive such a change. In many companies, the bottom-up movement is, is easy to get. Developers typically want things to get faster. They're excited. They feel like uh, they, they don't produce enough value. They'd like, like to do that. But it also needs to be a top-down decision from management to say, yeah, we're going to do it this way because everything has to change. The way you're going to dictate requirements, the way you're going to measure requirements. So you need to align everything in your company to become a continuous delivery company. And then you'll find tools to do that. But, ex but expecting that your, so your tools are going to solve your organizational challenges is, is, is not going to happen. Behave more like a product company own those streams of work in an iterative fashion. You need to, be, to feel part of that story and make it successful. It's not because you're going to be shipped two weeks on a project that you're going to feel ownership for that success. 
And also what we see sometimes are companies who want to start, but you know, nobody likes change. Everybody's pretty comfortable in their comfort zone. So, you know, it works today, why would I change? So the best way, if you want this to fail, I have a trick for you. Take a big project, take a complex project. Right? You're, well, I need clustering, I need multi-region load balancing, I need uh, all kind of sophisticated databases plus access to this ERP in China and the one in Europe. Yeah, that seems like a good candidate for my proof of concept. And that's going to fail. Don't even spend the money, it's going to fail. So why is this going to fail? Because again, trying this new way of doing things require you to change some of your process, some of your, the way you think about things, about the business, about how you roll, up, roll out value to the market. And those are not technical challenges. I can ensure you, you will find answers for technical challenges. So start with a basic project, start with an easy one. Maybe the most basic mobile application you can find that does very little, hooks into one of your backend system, and try it. Take a team, motivated team, and do a lot of discovery. Try it and see whether that works. And from there, expand. But don't make it a you know, big bang approach with big projects. It's going to fail, that's for sure. And you have to decide whether you want to remain uh, a nuclear plant uh, uh, a company or if you just want to consume electricity. Um, my last slide is, is an advice to you. I, I keep talking about books. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a big book reader, so I don't uh, I, I watch TV from time to time. But uh, this, is a, 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 this is a book you have to read, absolutely. It's called The Phoenix Project. It's pretty recent. Um, and for once, it's a novel, so uh, <laughs> you won't get bored. And for once, it's a novel that makes sense. You know, a lot of time when you read a novel on IT, you see, or, or a movie on IT, you see like the, the big screen with listing, and, and if you pause, you can see it's a Commodore 64 that's uh, displaying uh, old, uh, old, old code or whatever. It makes no sense. This has been written by people in the IT field in a daily basis in the trenches. And um, it starts with uh, uh, a guy in IT that gets called by his boss and gets promoted. Uh, to be the, the, the new CIO. Uh, okay, go fix it. And uh, this company is producing car parts and it's a big disaster. Uh, nobody's happy, customers, sales, it's, it's breaking all over the place. How do you get there? And uh, it's, uh, for people in IT, I can tell you it's very entertaining. At every chapter, you'll discover new people and you'll think, oh, that guy, that's me. This one, oh, that's John, yeah. And so you will feel great, you will feel horrible, depending on the chapters, because you will see clearly what you're doing wrong today. Uh, and uh, more than any presentation, any training you could do, I think you should start by reading The Phoenix Project. At CloudBees, everybody in sales and marketing, and I'm trying to push the engineers to read it as well, um, everybody had to read it. Uh, and we even had a, a, a book uh, club a reading session at Christmas uh, because I, I think it will, uh, it will uh, expand uh, what you thought about what you could do in, uh, in IT. Thank you. Well, I don't know your business, so uh, I, I'm not in a, an expert in all things, but uh, uh, I, I don't know what the cost involved in supporting old contracts. In, in I guess it's harder because once you, you, you commit to some things through a contract, people have expectations that it's going to last, right? So I'm not sure if I can uh, draw any uh, uh, smart uh, conclusion uh, without knowing that space. Does that make sense? I'm not helping you, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. one, of the reason, one of the reasons why many companies are reluctant to go into the cloud is that once you select a cloud service, 
you, you, you could run into a severe vendor lock-in problem because you transfer, you go to the service, you, you transfer all your data to the cloud, and it's very difficult to migrate from one service provider in the cloud to another. And as an example, if you look at the, the profit margin of Amazon, it's just outrageous. What the profits are be estimated to be between 50 and 80 percent. Yeah, so uh, vendor lock-in. So multiple ways to look at that. Um, data and, 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 and then lock-in of your applications per se. When it comes to data, I think the format of your data is going to be whatever database format you're going to choose. So the fact that they've been, they're out in the cloud I think is a good thing because they're simply getting closer to where your customers are. It doesn't necessarily, uh, I don't address at this point the fact that you might want to move from one vendor to the other, but just the fact that you want to move more of your data to the cloud, I think that's a natural thing. I, I, I suspect that in 10 years we're, we will consider remote to be your data center. So the boring place where we have to go and grab some data is going to be on-premises in the data center and the default location will be in the cloud where it's more connected and closer to where it's being consumed. While today it's, it's kind of the opposite, right? You have this, uh, a lot of assets on-premises, your Oracle rack and so on, and you have this CRM over there, uh, Salesforce, and you keep having to pull and synchronize data, so it's, it's kind of the boring uh, uh, thing. Uh, and, and that's going to that's gonna swap. Now, in terms of locking, I think there are different ways to look at, at lock-in. And, and uh, uh, if, if I focus on PaaS, for example, uh, PaaS has been cast initially as a big vendor lock-in because the first PaaS company out there was Salesforce with Force.com. Force.com came with its uh, own language. Uh, it was coming with its own database format, now called database.com, uh, with its own API. Essentially, the day you write one line of force.com, uh, you're screwed. It's locked in. Um, and so a lot of people started equating uh, a pass with, with lock-in. Now, if you look at what pass has become beyond those kind of 4GL type of platform as a service around SaaS, that, that's, a specific, uh, that's kind of a specific scenario if you look at offering like CloudBees, like Cloud, Cloud Foundry from uh, Pivotal VMware, from uh, OpenShift from Red Hat, and all of those. Your lock-in, if you look at what you're going to be deploying in those containers, those are going to be Java applications, for example, if you're a Java company. Uh, uh, they're going to be deployed on, on JBoss or on Glassfish or other J2E application servers. So there is no lock-in there. Uh, you can deploy uh, on CloudBees, for example, we're doing some proof of concept with some third party uh, cloud provider as we speak. Uh, you know, we can do deployment in Europe, in the US, outside of AWS, in one click, just disappear. What's your lock in? Your lock in with us is the API, the UI. Maybe, you know, you click on deploy on the CloudBees UI. But your database, it's MySQL or it's NoSQL, but that's, that's pretty much standard. Uh, JBoss, all of that, that's standard. Load balancer, that's going to be an Nginx or something like this. All of that, you can take it, rebuild it on premise. You won't like it. It's going to be painful because nobody likes to build stacks. But you have no lock in. So, what we see, for example, our company is moving from ex some existing application to the cloud. They can go, come, and back and forth. There is no such lock in. I think the lock in takes place. You have to be careful about lock in when you start using SaaS directly say salesforce.com, because you have all of your data categorized in a specific data format. But that's no different than what you're doing today. Today, if you're using SAP, don't tell me you don't have lock-in, right? Uh, you are locked into SAP. If you have all of your accounting in an ERP, you're not going to move next year to another ERP. It's going to be a tough decision. So I think SaaS, from that standpoint, offers the same level of lock-in as anything. Then the, the example you took before was infrastructure as a service. You said, well, if I start having scripts to directly handle my, uh, my infrastructure, my servers on Amazon, how can I go to Rackspace? How can I go to, you know, maybe tomorrow the Chat Telecom? Well, so it's true it can be uh, a level of locking. If you look at the base API, I want server, I want storage, and so on, you're relatively safe. You have plenty of tools. You can hear about Chef, about Puppet, about JCloud, a number of tools that abstract away from those vendors. The reason why Amazon is doing 
such great margins is that they have additional services. Like I want CDM, so the, to cache on dozens of point of presence around the world your, your content so that it's very quickly available. Uh, they're going to offer MySQL as a service. Great to use, you know. Super handy. That took uh, months for your IT team to build these available on, on demand. And so on. So they're offering a number of services. Some of them are not based on standards. If you are using MySQL as a service, you're safe, right? So you might want to do it. If you're going to use SQS, queuing technology, well, it's not standard, right? And, and others. So that's where you need to be careful. And sometimes it's hard to resist. It's hard to resist because I can tell you a lot of those services are damn useful and well implemented. So it's tempting to use them. And you start, and it's true. If you have in mind to move away from Amazon, you should be careful in taking in onboarding any of those services because it, it might bite you. <coughs>